Hey, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. It's Saturday morning, my friend, and you are listening to Light Talk. Well, good morning. This is Stan coming to you from Gainesville, Florida. And today we discuss my ion is acting up budgets. Why are we still using tungsten in the United States of America? What are dimmers good for? And what's in your pocket? All on Light Talk. And this is David coming to you from the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood of Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk and we are the Lumen Brothers. Originals. Absolutely, the originals. Uh, hey, welcome everyone to episode 284. And today you've got Stan, Steve and me together once again. And we're going to be talking about a lot of fun things today, I think. <laughs> Before we get started, I just want to remind everyone that if you want to join us on the show and ask us live questions, then send an email to stanK at iCloud.com. That's S-T-A-N-K-A-Y-E at iCloud.com. And he will be happy to give you all the information and you could be with the Lumen Brothers talking about your show. questions. Ask us a don't question. Don't be and can, shy. Don't be shy. We've had don't lots of fun doing this. Come on down, <laughs> as they say. But anyway, let's start off today with Letters to Light Talk Central. <laughs> well, our attorneys, Fleck, Flock, Flair, and Glare, sent us a certified letter. And I read it, and it's so shocking. I am just too upset to read this again. Stan, could you please read it for our listeners? I sure will. It says, and I was a bit shocked by this too, so let's listen to what these guys said. Dear Lumen Brothers, the law, they're very formal, by the way, the law offices of Fleck, Flock, Flare, and Glare is hereby serving you notice that due to your recent discussions with our former paralegal Snoot, along with the fact that we are now representing a disgraced former politician who no one wants to work for and who made us an offer we could not refuse, we are hereby terminating our relationship with you. Oh. Whoa. So, I know, so, whoa, so, that we don't leave without leave you without proper legal representation, let us suggest two options. You may wish to engage our new client's former attorney, RG Unlimited, or engage our former paralegal, Snoot Goldberg, who has just passed the bar. You may contact her at the Snoot Group with partners Sparks, Burnout, and Chase, Esquire. We appreciate <laughs> the five and a half years representing you, and thank you for your late payments. Sincerely, Seymour Glare, Esquire. A Seymour Glare. Seymour Glare. I like that. <laughs> I didn't know I that was Glare's first you know, name. I didn't know Glare's <laughs> first name was Seymour Glare. I had no that's idea pretty it was good. Seymour Glare, but that's good for Seymour. Uh, boy, this is just really upsetting, because you know what that means, guys? We're in trouble. We don't have any representation right now. So someone and, and we us. have an expired trademark. Oh, my God. Well, hey, we're at the mercy of Snoot. What are we going to do? The Snoot group, I should say. The Snoot group. We're going to have to ask the Snoot group. I think we may have represent. to bribe the Snoot group to work for us because yeah. we're not so easy. <laughs> I think Snoot knows that already. But I, I'm, I'm shocked. I'm, I'm shocked. Five and a half years. Five but and a half was, years. You know what? It's time for a change. Let them move on, you know? Well, you do remember, they, Fleck, Flock, Flair, and Glare were not our original attorneys. That's true. We right. had the same people as frickin' Frat. That's right. So, you know, that's, but we fired them quickly. Yeah, I, I, think, I think they wanted to leave in the first year, but they, we kept them because of popular demand. Well, no, not necessarily. I remember Ann McMills came on, and she got in a little chinwag with them. And suggested that we fire them, and we did, and we got Fleck, Flock, Flare, and Glare. I think she was the one who said, do not get rid of them. They're the best thing you got going. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it could be our story. So, but anyway, we're in trouble. What the hell are we going to do? We have to get the Snoop Group on a retainer and fast. Ah, Snoop Group. I don't know, Steve. What do you think? Well, I'm looking forward to the annual Snoot Group Christmas party in the Berkshires. So I think that's going to be great. I can't, I can't wait to go up there and, you know, ski and build snow angels and things like that. You know, Snoot, I, I trust Snoot. She's, you know, 
I mean, how many times did Fleck, Flock, Flare, and Glare actually answer an email? Never. I'm never. It was always Snoop. Always Snoop. Snoop always answered it. So she knows us. She knows us like the back of her hand. So I, 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 right. I trust her completely. Right. So listen, I'm going to take the um, take the, the initiative. Bull, I'll take the initiative, and I will call Snoot and um, Look, write, write a big check. <laughs> write a big check. We've got to give her a retainer. As a matter of fact, not- okay, this is a, see, I shouldn't be talking about this on the air, but I'm actually going on a little trip with Snoot next weekend. Whoa. <laughs> well, we're going to pick up a Mellotron that has been given to me by the guitar player of Three Dog Night. Very long story. <laughs> why, do you need a, why do you need a lawyer for this? Well, well, it's a very important thing. We have things to discuss, and I will bring this up in our discussions. The I whole thing very, is tax deductible. You should deductible. Very, be very careful about what you do. You know, you could get in trouble. I'm not going to get in trouble. Guys, listen. <laughs> Lori's going with him. It's not, <laughs> it's not like a, a dirty weekend There are in three Brighton. of us. It's going to be me, Lori, and Snoot. Exactly. Is Snoot so, a puppet? Let's just No, Snoot is Snoot. Okay? But anyway, I'll talk to Snoot. Maybe Lori can, you know, somehow ease it in because she's very good about these things and uh and we'll keep snoot away from snare from snare <laughs> we'll keep snoot away from stan <laughs> that, that would be good <laughs> and i think we're gonna be okay okay <laughs> so you know you know her her birth name is sandra snoots it's Sa- sandra goldberg i did not know that she picked she picked that name up in high school okay. I, I don't know the backstory on it but she's never gone into it all right well, between Sandra, Lori, and me, we'll have three Jews in a car and a Mellotron. So there you go. It's that <laughs> is too much no, information. No, it's three Jews and a van in a Mellotron because <laughs> it's going to be a big old white van. So anyway, all right. Well, listen, let's not worry about it now. Let's not say anything stupid so we don't get uh, uh, sued for this uh, this week until we get somebody on retainer, okay? Well, Rick is waiting to ask his question. Rick, okay. So, well, Rick, Rick's got the first question, or you've got the first question. Stan's I got have, the first it's question. Rick, it's today. Rick, Rick who's go. calling in. Okay. From, from, is he calling in? Rick from, yeah, I hear him in my head. Okay. There you go. <laughs> okay. Rick in Tennessee writes, last night our ETC ION would not run a queue. We would push go, and the queue would seem to run on the screen, but nothing happened on stage. <laughs> We have determined it's not a DMX issue. Suggestions. Well, if you waited this long to hear from us, uh, you know, you probably didn't have a very happy audience. <laughs> I, would have picked, I would have picked up the phone, called ETC right away, uh, 24-7. Those guys are great. And you would have had an answer in probably 30 seconds. Uh, me, all I can do is speculate. I don't know. So three things that came to mind. So the, the board's running, you see channels counting down, you see levels changing, so that means the computer is working okay. I don't know how you confirm that you have DMX. It means where you have DMX. I don't know what your network topography is. There's a lot of variables out there. But I would start with big things first. You know, but it's usually a small thing. But I would make sure that the dimmer is powered up. What if the rack's down? Yeah, you could be sending DMX and you know your company switch could be out, your transformer mm-hmm. could have blown, you could have had a, you know, some kind of outage where the whole rack is just not producing. And as long as we're at the rack, the next place I would just run my eyes across to be the CEM. That's the control electronics module in your dimmer rack. If that thing's dead, it's might as not it's not you could spit out all the DMX in the world. <laughs> that's that's the thing that processes the DMX and sends it down the network pipes. So I would check the CEM. Sometimes they get stuck. Sometimes a little spike, a little lightning. You know, they can get, they can go. It's always, by the way, it's always good to have a spare CEM. When we, when we used to put dimmer racks in, we're going to get to that later. We would always specify a spare CEM. They're about, they're like a thousand dollars, but they're good to have in the building. And then the other thing that could be happening is, you know, you could be putting DMX out of the back of the console, but everything goes through these network uh, gateways, and gateways can fail. They could not have power. They could have, it could, or it could be as simple as a wire came off somewhere. Check your runs, check your DMS. There's a lot to check in the chain. But those are the three big ones that come to mind for me. Uh, what do you guys have? Well, Rick, I'm, I'm going to look at it completely differently. Uh, don't mean to insult you. And I don't know what generation ion you're running, which that has some, um, um, I need to, I kind of need to know that to answer the question. But, so, 
you know, you say it's not DMX and you see everything running on the console. Don't, don't mean to insult you here. Is the grandmaster up? That's always a good question. Because if the grandmaster <laughs> is down, then <laughs> nothing's going to work. And it's a, it often is the issue. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not sure because I don't mess around with an ion every day. And there, again, there's been a lot of generations of this and a lot of software. I kind of vaguely remember that kind of the earlier-ish ones, and I could be wrong about this, uh, the crossfaders also have to be engaged. They have to be activated. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, nothing happens. Not, not, everything is running, and you're, you're kind of staring at it going, why is nothing happening on stage? So those are the two, like, uh, it costs you nothing to look at. David, what about you? I don't know. I, yeah, when, when you said about the Grandmaster, that gave me a chuckle because I've seen that happen before. Oh, yeah, that happens a lot. But I believe on at least the newer versions of the Ion software... In the EO software, when the Grandmaster's down, there's a big red blinking light saying, Your yeah, Grandmaster's down. Yeah, there is. That's down. true. That's so, true. Unless the, the operator is, you know, <laughs> really hard of seeing. I don't think uh, that Rick is. Rick is a, a smart guy. He's a he's smart guy. Okay. Or he's in full panic mode. <laughs> he is there. It's working. <laughs> yeah, he's missing the bleeding obvious. To me, it's usually a DMX issue. But um, so, are we going to call him back and find out what the hell the answer was? Or if Rick he... calls me, I promise I'll answer the email. We are, and very kindly. I'm, I'm very, I'm I very kind nice of stumped to the chumps here. I think we're stumped. We're officially stumped. We're just coming well, up with stuff out of our stumpers. <laughs> you know, I mean, we have no idea. Hmm. You could have the channels captured. I mean, I, I don't know. There's. Uh... No, it's but also, you see the, uh, when the channels are captured. Yeah, if, if the channels are moving, if the queue is ro- now Steve's point about the about the crossfaders, sometimes if like the board was turned off and turned back on, and the fader was like not at one end or the other, it was like in between, that could do it. Hmm. Like if the fader is like a, a you know a micron off the top of the bottom edge, like it's at ninety nine percent and it hasn't finished the queue and it's just sitting there. Uh, and the board was turned off and turned back on. That's how that's how the grandmaster happens a lot, you know. I'm thinking if DMX, he says it's not a DMX issue. Where is he checking the DMX? Is he checking it at the well? That's fixture? the we, we don't know. Right? Is he checking right. it at know. the dimmer? Uh, if there are dimmers, we'll talk about that later. Well, if he has a DMX checker, he could plug it into the. You would plug it into to the first. I plug it into the back of the board. Right. right? Okay. So I got DMX okay. going out, but between the board and between the dimmer rack, right? You know. If it's, a, if it's a direct hard line, whether it's network or whether it's a hard line to the rack, and there's no breaks in that line, it's not going over network, that's a straight shot on an older, on an older system. On a new, the new systems are all DMX over Ethernet, which gets back to the conversation you guys had last week about, which I listened to, by the way. Wow, about, you actually listened uh, uh, to a show you weren't on? Yes, yeah, wow. sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I do. What did I you think? Bored. Did you think it was a good show, when Stan? I, I did. I did think it was a good show. And, and, and um, I think it's a good chemistry with Ellen in there and all those things. But you guys mentioned, you know, the need for um, network people and IT people. We put in, like right now, when we put in a circuit box, because we, well, we'll talk about this later, but we'll not put one circuit in a lighting position or two circuits in a lighting position because we're doing LED automation. Mm-hmm. But in that, in that box with 220 volt circuits, we usually with PowerCon connectors, we put a response gateway. So there's an ether there's either a DMX five pin or an Ethernet right there in the box. Right. And anywhere along that chain, you could have a break. You know, or you know, Ethernet cable, you know, cable's the weakest link and DMX is, you know, by good cable. Who knows? You, you know, it could it could be like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and Probability. <laughs> all of his all of his lamps could be burned out too. That's true. All the yeah. lamps could be out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anna in Portland asks, I have a budget question. I hear that sometimes management will want to see a design before the budget is in place. Is this common? Uh, you know something? It's not exa- exactly common, but it does occur. And it usually occurs in much larger scale companies and shows. Like, for instance, uh, when a company hires your team to come up with a new production of Lulu. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to throw this right out of my head, out of my butt here. Because this actually happened. Uh, we were hired to 
do a new production of Lulu, which is a, an amazing piece of musical theater that re- is rarely done because it's just so expensive to do. <laughs> it's very challenging in a lot of ways. They will ask us to come up pretty much with you know, a concept and ideas. Before, you know, we say, well, how much do we have? One million, three million, five million? No, no, no. Just show us what you have. Just show us what you want. Okay? Now, there are good things and bad things about that. First of all, if you're not worrying about budget, then you don't have to really worry. But, you know, actually, I'm going to actually go back and not even talk about Lulu right now. I'm going to talk about Die Frauenschatten. And this happened at the uh, Lyric Opera Chicago. And they did one of these things, and the set designer, Kevin Knight, and myself, and of course, um, Paul Curran, who's been on our show, uh, we came up with this amazing set, and it was a gigantic wall, LED wall. And we wanted to do all these projections that were embedded in the set. It was huge. It was this huge sort of curve that went along a double um, uh, revolve, sort of like the type of revolve in Hamilton, but like three times the size. And of course, this is about, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago. And the LED wall would have probably ended up costing, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, but we came up with it. And uh, they met with us. We were doing a show in uh, Toronto. And they came up to meet with us. And they said, we love it. You know, the sketches are great, but it's much too expensive. <laughs> and that's the problem. That's the problem. You know, you need to have an idea of how much money they have. But a lot of times, companies don't want to restrict us. And on the other hand, Lulu, I don't believe there were any budget cuts. They may have been small, but we were in the ballpark the first time and we created a film for that show. So that was very expensive. So yeah, it happens sometimes, but most of the time when you're working in a Lort theater or you're working obviously in in educational theater, there will be a budget. (laughs) So you have a pretty good idea. I'm not going to be able to afford something like this, this LED wall. Let's do maybe a front projection. (laughs) <laughs> How about you guys? What do you think? Well, if we if we take uh, Beverly Emmons' advice, uh, she will tell you that sixty uh, percent of the show has to go to uh, expenses, and forty percent is profit. So you you could, um, if you're working at a small theater, maybe, or you could just run the potential profit of the show. You know what what is the most money we can make? Being very optimistic. And then take sixty percent of that and go that that's the budget, and then figure out what that but how that budget has to be split among um, three or four design areas, plus you know acting and directing and everybody else. So you can get a sense of what your budget's going to be. You can rough it in on what it's going to be. Well, you know, also, and you're right. If you're doing commercial theater, which is what you're talking about, uh, absolutely. I, I guess you can figure it out that way. Uh, sometimes, though, when you're working, especially when you're working in Europe, where money is almost unlimited, even though it's not, <laughs> um, yes, you, you can pretty much not worry about the ticket sales. But in most places in the United States, you do. Stan, do you have anything to add to that? I, I'm trying to associate, you know, I'm doing consulting now, so I'm working in a different field. And, I, and I, of course, I have that, everything you say about You guys always have budgets, don't you, though? Well, that's what I was kind of thinking about. Like, you know, how does that happen? Typically, if we're working with a, a municipality, a public dollars project, there is a number that has been allocated by the powers that be. It's typically done by – architecture does it by square footage. Everything is square footage. And, and square footage for a particular thing, plumbing, electric, electrics, lighting, you know, everything is going gonna, is gonna to boil down. And in fact, I got an, a, a request the other day. There was a, a meeting today for a competition for a project that we made that were on one of the teams. And the guy says, your architect is a list of things. Okay, acoustics, square footage, you know, uh, this square. And then like dr- theater drapery, what's the square footage cost? Well, I can't do it. I cannot calculate drapery for a theater in square footage terms, right? So I just know what it, I know how big the stage is. But then if we talk about public, private dollars rather, um, a project can come and say, "We w- th- this is the program, this is the show we want to do, okay, the same way, the play, or this is what we want to do, and then, and then you design it, and then they have somebody price it. Now, we have cost estimators. Now, interestingly, I have not had a chance to work with these guys, but there's a few firms in the country that are specialists in 
cost estimation for performing arts facilities. So they can actually look at your seat count, the demographics, where it's going to be built, who the owners are, what kind of, what kind of shows you're going to run. And they can put a square footage price on a building with, with amazing accuracy. But I've never worked on a project where somebody said, like, if, I guess if you were doing, you know, if you were, if you were the Disney family, okay, well, we want to do this concert hall in L.A., and you hire Frank Gehry, you don't give him a budget. <laughs> I mean, if Frank Gehry's designing your building, you just, I want a Gehry building, and it's going to be what it's going to be. The one I'm doing right now for the private school, the owners came with $8 million. The, bu- the building's going to run 10 to 12. Now we're looking to make some cost savings, but we're going to land in that zone. But I've rarely had a carte blanche, David, what you're talking about, where it's just design it. And we'll figure it out later. I think there's always, I, I would rather have parameters than have a money, no object situation. Well, myself. you know, sometimes in the opera world, they have sponsors who underwrite the productions. They're not really, right. They could be sponsors, right. they could be banks, they could be individual people with a lot of money who want to support mm-hmm. the opera. And uh, they would like to sell the, the visuals to these people and say, we only need another million dollars and we can do this. So well, that's another reason why sometimes they would like to see concept drawings uh, before, you know, they even tell us what the budget's going to be. You know, with what you just said, let me try and back in with something you made me think of. So in, in the architecture world, very often the owners are trying to raise money. Not, so a, pro, a public school system, not the, not the case. But in the one I'm doing now, the private school, very much they're raising money. So, the, so what they really want the, the designer to do early on is they have a nice name for it. They call it the eyewash. They want to have these renderings that sell the project. So these guys did, and you saw them, David, I showed you those renders, and they, were, they, they did about a dozen renders that also with configurations, and they're beautiful. And recently, when they, they had the first estimate done, it was like two, $3 million over. And the owners were like, oh, we may have to make some cuts or whatever, but... You know, but it, could it still look like that? You know, they, they're, they're now hooked on the look, so to, if you will, hooked on the look. So they're hooked on the look, which means they're going to try harder to, to raise what they need. But, what, but often what happens is an unsophisticated client will cut functionality to keep the look. You see it in big performing <laughs> arts centers. We're not going to cut the lobby, but we'll go to manual rigging. We're not going to cut the lobby or the reception hall or the, or the, the granite in the bathrooms, but we'll cut... The lighting system. Yeah, that's because right. that's what the donors see. They see the bathrooms, right. they Correct. see the lobby, all that right. stuff. Before we end this, this, another thing you need to consider with this, budget does not only mean money, it also means time. L- that's right. And time is, is part of the budget. So sometimes uh, it doesn't matter how much money you have. If you only have seven days in the theater, there's only so much you can do. So that's another thing that you really need to uh, look at before you move on. Well, Carl in Berlin writes, Was the exit from tungsten to LED a no-starter in the USA? It seems you guys still have large inventories of tungsten-based equipment. That's because we're poor and we can't afford LED. (laughs) No, it's because we're cheap. (laughs) Oh, cheap too. Cheap and poor. Go ahead, Steve. Funny you ask that question (laughs) uh, because this conversation began, if you remember, back in 2007. So it's only been 15 years. And Carl, what do you expect? (laughs) <laughs> I was trying to do some research and, and f- figure out what the story was. And literally today, Tuesday, the 6th, literally today, the Department of Energy announced new rules to phase incandescent light bulbs out of production mm. and sale in the United States before a ban takes place in 2023. Now, they did not offer any clarity to what that ban means. But they started talking about efficiency and the efficiency levels they have set and are their guidelines. Tungsten lamps simply cannot meet uh, the efficiency of LED fixtures. So you can go to the Department of Energy site and there's got a whole paper posted on this about what they're doing and why they're doing it. I do think I did uh, what I did find and you take this with a grain of salt because it could be completely incorrect information. I seem to find that the lamp, the first lamp to go here 
has been the MR16, that little uh, projection lamp that goes in a birdie. Apparently, that is no more. And of course, a lot of arc lamps are now gone. Um, you can look at the really large production companies in this country, and they're all kind of screaming because they're holding large inventories of incandescent uh, tungsten fixtures that uh, they simply cannot get lamps for anymore. Or the lamp that they're substituting uh, is going from something goofy like eight or 900 hours of projected lamp life down to 50 to, to 100. So people are really kind of taking this on the chin here. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, we're going to fall in line as a country. The DOE has said it's going to happen. They, and they've, I, I was surprised when I read that 2023 was, in their words, a total ban will take effect on uh, tungsten-based equipment. So we'll see. We'll see, Carl. But what about all those companies that don't have the money to reinvest, buy new lighting fixtures, buy relays? <laughs> uh, well, you know, at, I mean, at what, at, at what, okay, so here, here's the simple answer to that. Um, get over it, all you guys. <laughs> you know, a, okay, the reason I say answer. that <laughs> is that, you know, we've got this thing coming up, a uh, discussion of dimmers. Come on, dimmer racks. You, you, if, if you've got a dimmer rack that's, I don't know, 10 years old, what's your parts inventory like? If you have a moving light that's 10 years old, what, what's, your invent, what's your parts inventory like? The world is moving fast. Technology is moving fast. Chips are changing. Monitors are changing. This is a rough time right now because we're getting new things every day of the week. And simply part inventories are, are falling by the wayside. So lamps, you know, the same thing. The same thing is going to happen. They are falling by the wayside. If you go to some of the big lamp manufacturers, I mean, it is very hard to find just a, a basic quartz lamp anymore. We've been, I mean, we've been talking about this for 15 years. You know, how long is it going to take for uh, us to catch up with everyone else? So in other words, we're okay with allowing some small theater companies to die, right? Because I don't that's think basically they'll what's die. Well, I, I, I mean, don't if think they they'll come die. in and they ban uh, tungsten fix. For instance, let's talk like Central City Opera, a company that's near and dear to my heart. They still are running old dimmers. The dimmers you can uh, hear from out in the house. You can sort of hear them humming away. And uh, they can't afford to buy all new LED equipment. They can't afford it. And, you know, and I know the budgeting there. These are my friends. I know that they're, they're not, you know, saving money in a shoe somewhere. Uh, they, you know, they just can't afford it. So there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of companies like this in the United States that just cannot afford to do this. Now, if there was some sort of supplement money that came from, you know, the government or the state, the state or the federal government or whatever, uh, then that would be one thing, but I see none of that happening right now. And uh, I think we're going to have a lot of uh, casualties here if indeed they say you can't use these lights anymore, you can't use these dimmers anymore. I agree with you, Steve, and, and Stan. I know, Stan, you, you feel this way as well. But, you know, this, it's, uh, we have to look at the people that are going to be hurt by it. Well, the, the, the DOE numbers on this, and I don't know where they get their numbers, but um, they are arguing that the transfer in the United States from a tungsten-based world to an LED world will uh, show a net gain uh, of about $3 billion. The, the cost of energy, uh, theaters, industry, residential, They'll, they'll save about $3 billion a year just in energy costs by going to a more efficient lamp. Yeah, but it's not going to pay for all that new equipment. Well, the thing about it is, is I, I've, um, I, I'm old enough to remember the early days of rock and roll when a, a moving light was $20,000. You can buy a darn good light from a very good company now for about 3500 maybe five on a bad day. So I think this, we'll see the same thing happen with conventional fixtures. I think static fixtures will get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Uh, I don't know if we've hit the bottom on moving lights yet, but I, th I think things will radically change. I think we'll see innovation coming along and companies will say, I, 
I'm, I'm happy to make this profit on this equipment as opposed to making the year on, on this equipment that I'm selling. I mean, people said they couldn't sell a light. I mean, 15 years ago, you couldn't sell a moving light for less than $10,000. You couldn't make one. That's simply not true anymore. And I think LED technology uh, will get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Again, sometimes people don't move because they want to. Sometimes they move because they have to, right? And that's what's that's what's going to be in play here. And if those and if if Central City has donors, well, that's, they're going to go to. Then it's time to go to the well if they can't find it. Sometimes municipalities provide. Sometimes the Department of Energy provides grants. There will be opportunity, but I think it's not. A, it's not a do they want to. It's going to be a you have to, uh, and and um, there's just no way around it. Well, look at what happened to Altman. Altman is out there selling thousands and thousands of light. The color trend fixture came out, which was twice as expensive and extremely good for its day. Mm -hmm. And then when you think color trend has the market um, sewn up, within a year or so, here comes ETC in the Source 4, which was probably two and a half times more expensive than Altman. David Cunningham, and, right, yeah. And everyone kept saying, oh, no one's going to buy that. No one's going to buy that. It's way too expensive. Right. You know, they couldn't, they couldn't make enough mm -hmm. that first season. Mm -hmm. yeah, it, well, it, time will tell. You are listening to Light Talk, and today, Light Talk is sponsored by... Bad Ombre Stage Productions. Has your career as a lighting designer taken a nosedive? Are you now the go-to LD for roadside aquariums, swim <laughs> meets, and the local water park? Are you finding that each day seems just a bit more complicated and deadly with all that electricity around you? You can't keep wearing rubber boots and gloves. People will start to talk. What to do? Well, kittens say adios to Mr. Edison and hola to James Watt. Way back in 1781, Scottish engineer James Watt patented his steam engine. And shortly thereafter, the steam leco. But by the early 20th century, the steam leco had fallen out of favor with the Nikola Tesla fanboys. However, given the EU's recent position on tungsten lamps, the steam leco is seeing a rebirth as the go-to green light source. That's right. The lost colony can say goodbye to being zapped when it rains. Not only that, the steam leco will work with both fresh and salt water, snow or ice, and in a pinch, it will even work with milk. You are welcome, Wisconsin. Select models can also be used as a hazer. The Steam Leco, suitable for festivals, rodeos, and state fairs. The Steam Leco, always a hit with the Trigun crowd. The Steam Leco, available now from Bad Ombre Stage Productions. And it doesn't need a stinking dimmer. <laughs> and now, back to Light Talk. Well, the sounds of those rabid monkeys prancing about the studio tells us that once again it's time for Let's Talk About. And today's Let's Talk About is all about... Good night, dimmers! Good morning, relays! Is it time to throw dimmers into the scrap heap? Put them to bed. <laughs> I think we have a, a theme for our show today. <laughs> What's past is, is crap. No, <laughs> What's future is wonderful. I love wonderful. the past. I love my fountain pens. I love, uh, I love things. Your fountains. <laughs> I love my fountain pens. I love Do them. you like seal your envelopes with wax? <laughs> with he seals it with a kiss. That's what I hear. A kiss. A kiss. Yes. Oh no! I, I have a beautiful Lamy two thousand right here. If you can see it, this is a beautiful pen. Okay, it's it's a beautiful, beautiful work of art. And and you, and you know, you turn the top here to spin the plunge to pull it, and you can't even see the seam. This it 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 is in the it is in the Museum of Modern Art. The Lamy two thousand. It's a beautiful thing. I like the past, but it ain't no dimmer. <laughs> they only they only allow crayons in my home, <laughs> so that's it. I can only play with crayons. Well, let me let, let me say I can't wait to see the dimmer say adios. I, <laughs> I I work in a small theater, and I'm telling you right now, we we are pulling out. Dimming is is a, a thing of the past. It's going away. We hit critical overload when we realized that we could not run the show 
and the dishwasher in the kitchen at the same time. <laughs> so, I mean, some theaters have a limited yeah. amount of power That's in true. them. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, dimmers yeah. are just not not it anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a yeah, 20th well. century technology. Yeah. And we're in the 21st century, damn it. We're almost a quarter of the way through the 21st That's century. That's right. We're almost like in three years, we'll be a quarter of the way through. Isn't that crazy? There are people out there who need to get into the modern world. And I mean people who have a lot of clout, like theater consultants who, let's say preeminent theater consultants who are still thinking they need to be putting dimmers in to brand new facilities. I mean, we don't do that. We haven't done that in five years on any of our projects. We just don't. And, and here's how I justify it. When people ask, well, let's just talk about the dimmer rack costs, 50, 75, $90,000, you know, for a rack. Let's just talk about distributing circuitry and how much copper you've got to distribute. Okay, then let's talk about the heat load on the building of the incandescent lamp. And let's talk about a light plot in, let's say, a medium-sized high school that's going to have 150 to 175 incandescent fixtures. I can do that with 35 movers and have more artistic capability and put two circuits in each position and daisy-chain the circuitry. So it's just not a responsible decision. I don't understand it at all. And... And I was telling David earlier today, we just picked up a project. I think I can talk about this because the contract is, is uh, in the works. University of Wyoming, Laramie, we were contacted. Light, uh, replace, uh, dimmer replacement and control system. Uh, there's a budget. My big question is, which will be the first meeting next week, what's the, what's the fixture inventory? So are they all incandescent? Okay. It, are they partial incandescent and movers and LED? I don't know. But do I really want to put new dimmer racks in in 2022? No. What I need to do is use the savings from a, a smaller amount of distribution, okay, and relays, IQ breakers, for example, and spend that on modern fixtures and get them into this century. And I'm going to do everything I can with the, with the money that I have and spend it wisely. So unless somebody says to me, I'm Alvin Ailey and we've got to have tungsten front light or we've got to have tungsten shin busters, there are situations like that where people are not ready to make the move, I'm sure. But it's just a matter of time. So that's my take and that's what we're trying to do and we're trying to bring people. And we're not doing any projects and we have six or seven running right now. None of them have dimmer racks. Yeah, you know, I, I got to agree. <laughs> We're in the 21st century, uh, especially when you're building new facilities. That is when you spend the money. Uh, you don't like go back and say, well, you know, we got these old strand dimmers, you know, CD80. That's exactly what let's, I've got. That's exactly what's in Wyoming, <laughs> CD80. Let's pull them out they're, of that closet and put them into a new closet. Yeah, that's like renovating. They're coming out. You know, n- no, man. Use that new closet for a classroom <laughs> <laughs> and get a bunch of relays and you're going to be fine. And it's going to be cooler. It's, I mean, it's just so much. I, I just don't get it when people put in new facilities and they still have, you know, incandescent fixtures. And now I still think you need a handful of incandescent fixtures. I still don't think LEDs there yet when it comes to front light. So I think, you know, maybe a couple of dozen for the front of house and then you can use color washes. But I, but that's about it. If you can go dimmer, and and then you don't still don't need dimmer racks. You just put little you know portable dimmers in them, or you know, or or you find some uh, twelve fixtures pack. with dimmers inside. There were twelve pack right there, exactly. So you don't need to go to all that expense with distribution. My God, uh, and wait, and oh, it's yeah, a waste of involved. it's it's a terrible use of if, if you put the if we put our sustainability hat on, it's a terrible waste of copper of mining. It's a terrible waste of labor. It's a huge expenditure of, of, of energy. Electricity. I mean, electricity, yeah. heat load. There's just so many reasons. Heat. Heat, yes. heat load. There's just, there's just, it's unjustifiable. And I was shocked when I was hearing about somebody who I would have a lot of respect for was like, I, I'm scratching my head. I'm going, seriously? 
Well, that's because it doesn't matter to them if a school district buys. This it wasn't and a gets school district. A bed. This was a pri- well, This is a big private oh. project. A major, major name in theater consulting. Major name. Well, you know that's the thing. What can you do? You can't fight city hall, as they say. If they want to spend their money that way or waste it, in my opinion, uh, then let. Them, I guess you know that's. They're, they're, it's their facility, right? Well, I mean, this is something that rock and roll industry faced uh, in the 80s. It was like, oh, my, my tour has to have 400 to 600 pars in it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that that's a lot of, tr- it's a lot of, tr- it's a, and, and uh, Morpheus, mm-hmm. it's a lot of truck space. It's a lot of power. It's a lot of labor. And everyone said, oh, moving lights, it's, it's, they're not here to stay. <laughs> but look at the big tours now. You know, if, if you have the budget and you want to put that kind of stadium show up, that's fantastic. But most of these tours are fairly lean and mean, in fast, beautiful looks. Mm-hmm. Projection and, and LED and uh, moving lights have taken them over. So these, these days of I've got to have 100 more park hands than uh, electric light orchestra <laughs> is uh, w- way gone. And, you know... That that didn't kill the industry. No, it, it people grew it. Gear, g- people ge- geared up for that. You know, there. I was looking uh, today on eBay, and I noticed uh, some VL fives, which you can't get that lamp anymore. But they're on sale now for 150, 160 bucks. Mm. You know, well, they could be worth le- nothing if you can't buy if you can't buy the lamp. What the hell are exactly. you going to like? <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine good- that? I'm oh, sure there's someone man. who's going to buy them and, and convince themselves that they can find a oh, lamp for it. That's terrible. That's a problem. Things change, and it's all right. Yeah. It's like those monkeys. Those monkeys are evolving from monkeys into lighting designers. Yeah. That's why they're so excited. Talk about slow. Rock and roll. At least those, you know, maybe that was more about male ego and how many lights I got. You know, I think, I think the, the shift, Broadway has already made the shift. I don't know about regionals, but... Um, Certainly, we're pushing it in schools, and um, it, it, when, once we explain the economics, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, it's a no-brainer. And when we went to LED, it was like I just got the, the provost up there and said, okay, this is what it's going to cost a year in energy cost. <laughs> you know, and we're going to break even in like nine years. So there you go. I, I do think what's unfortunate um, on the uh, – yeah, a little hubris here – when I look at the Department of Energy's website on this, they they s- still say that LED fixtures have a thirty thousand to fifty thousand yeah, hour that's a little lamp dangerous, life. Dangerous, right? You know, that's like they found one that worked that way. Certainly, they have a longer lamp life than tungsten. Yeah. But I, I still look at those numbers and go, "Come on, yeah. let's be realistic yeah. about it. let's let's celebrate the fact that it lasts ten thousand hours." Right. Yeah, as right. opposed to a thousand hours. Right. Those are theoretical yeah. numbers. It's laboratory right. numbers. Yeah. Well, Steve has the last question of the day. It is Angus in Colorado. And he writes, just curious about what your designer EDC is. So I, I don't really have kind of an everyday carry as a designer. Uh, you know, but what I do have is some things I move into the theater with me. So maybe that's what you mean. Uh, you know, when I move into a theater, I'm, I'm still old school. I take a, a pad of graph paper with me, some pencils, a sharpener, and an eraser. I do splurge and have my own two little lights. So I, I, want, I want to run two of them at about 25%. I have my own headset because I want to be comfortable. Of course, I have my magic sheet and my script. And then uh, a couple gel books, and of course my Roscoe mix book is now a feature at the table. And finally, I have a bottle of water and a digital clock. Yeah, yes, I know there's a clock on a console, but I want to see big numbers down in front of me, and I know I've only got half an hour left in this session. So pretty light. That's about all I need. Maybe I'll throw in a pocket flashlight if I've got to wander around and, I don't know, try to find the bathroom in a dark theater, but... Uh, you know, I don't have tools. I don't need that. I don't need much of anything just to do my job. David, you do a lot of stuff on the road. Do you have a designer EDC? Uh, I have an EDC, and it's called an iPad. Um, and it's, uh, I also have, usually bring, I usually bring an iPad, uh, my iPhone, and my MacBook Pro. And everything is on those three devices. 
if there's a score involved, there'll be a hard score. Not I don't do the scores on the computer because I like to flip through pages. And usually my assistant is following the, the show and the score. So whenever I like look for something, that page is open and his finger is on the bar. By the way, that's a very, very good t- uh, skill to learn if you want to do some pretty big shows is you need to follow a score. You need to know exactly what bar we're on because that's what a designer wants to see sometimes. Also, my Margarita to Go machine, along with my solar-powered garden gnome. <laughs> and I usually, usually bring a lot of uh, goodies. <laughs> but seriously, no, I mean, that's, uh, I basically bring my electronics and whatever, you know, script of books that, that I need. You know, it's funny you mentioned about the time on the uh, console, the clock. In my uh, experience, that clock is usually off by several hours. <laughs> so it doesn't, it doesn't help me at all. For theater, my new everyday carry, aside to all the items that you guys have mentioned, some kind of computer, some kind of pad, some kind of pen, pencil, all of that stuff. But uh, I bring the lava light now. I bring the lava light that High End gave to me because um, it relaxes me at the table. That's, that's my, my ambient lighting condition. It's, and it's great. Um, but I carry with me uh, these things. Uh, it could be, it could, not necessarily for theater, but it could be. I carry a laser pointer, right? So if I'm on a job site, I can want to point something out. And somebody's like, no, I don't say over there. I just point at it so it's unambiguous. I have a laser measure so I know how I can measure a distance really quickly. I always have a, good, a reasonably good camera. Um, and then I have a really cool thing that I learned from an architect um, when doing inspections it's a, it's a mirror on a stick. So it's a little like a big like dental mirror on a telescoping like old school antenna. And you slide that out and you put that mirror up and you could look places where <laughs> you could like get your eyeball, like, like, like above a doorway or whatever, or look around the corner. So those are kind of things. That, and then I carry a, uh, a meter to uh, test continuity on, um, on networks. So I can put a, I can put a pin at one end and then walk to another side of the room and put it in and see if we're getting, uh, see if we're getting uh, continuity in, in that regard. I agree with you on the lava lamp. If um, the show is going, if tech is going well, if, I'm, if, and if it's someone I've worked with before, the lava lamp comes out. It keeps, it keeps everybody sort of calm. It's a calming fat. Uh, I have a friend who brings his mouse pad is a little Turkish carpet with the fringes and that, rela- <laughs> and that, you know, and that relaxes him. You know, that's where his mouse goes. So little creature comforts, I think, that set, set the tone. And the lava lamp, when I was do, uh, before the, the pandemic, every time I went to tech, I brought the lava lamp in. And it just, it just changes the tone. It, everybody feels groovy. Yeah. The problem is, 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 is when you go on the road and you're trying to you get, <laughs> you get the little baby lava lamp. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I don't think getting it past uh, <laughs> security is tough. You, you put it into your rider. <laughs> Theater yeah. shall provide a lava <laughs> lamp. There you go, David. There lava you go. Lamp. Well, the rocking sounds of Illuminoids tells us that once again you've spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on just about every podcast site out there. Check out our website on lighttalk.org and be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to the podcast. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However, I think I'm going to have to uh, improvise here because Black Flock, Flare, and Glare, and Snoop are no more. They're gone. No, they're not with us. They're not with us. So we, we are unprotected. We are unprotected. We are having unprotected oh. light talk. This is a problem. So <laughs> if you want to uh, litigate, this is the week. <laughs> better, better call Snoop. Better call Snoop. Better call, better call Snoop. Snoop. So this is so better we call are, Snoop. I love that. Th- this is like Cobra. <laughs> we don't have Cobra. <laughs> We don't have coverage from now until we get the Snoop Group signed. So we are in legal limbo, baby. Legal limbo. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers. Coming to you from Long Beach, Gainesville, and the Lone Star State. And be sure to join us next week when we talk about more lighting shenanigans and serve you more of our casserole of nonsense. Light Talkers broadcasting freely around the world without protection. (laughs) And we'll see you all next Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Light Talk.